Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. Psalm 31, 5. Welcome to the Into Your Hand podcast with Brendan and Wesley. Today we are discussing the Sabbath School Bible Study for December 19th. This quarter is entitled Education. This week's lesson is entitled Sabbath, Experiencing and Living the Character of God. The memory verse this week is Mark 2, 27 and 28. Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. A special thank you to Fountain View Academy for giving us permission to share their music ministry with you. Links to Fountain View Academy are in the description. God bless you all. God took six days and created earth and moon, the stars and sun. On the seventh day he rested from the work that he had done. Then he blessed it, made it holy as a gift for Just how this world began. Holy day, purified, set apart, sanctified, enter into joy divine in a temple made of time. See him worship. Sabbath as his weekly custom was. Feel the fury of the rabbis, for he would not heed their laws. So they killed him on a hillside as the sun began to fade. But he even kept the Sabbath. As they laid him in the grave Holy day, purified Set apart, sanctified Enter into joy divine In a temple made of Forsaken and forgotten, desecrated and profaned. But the sacred fourth commandment is still valid and unchanged. Hear the Father gently calling, if you love me, heed each one, not for merit salvation but because you love my son holy day purified set apart sanctified enter into joy divine in a temple made of time holy day 
Heavenly Father, thank you for this uh, time and your many blessings this week. Lord, be with this lesson. It's a very important one. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let us open our hearts and minds to you. We know that you're knocking on our hearts. Into your hands we commit our spirits. Clean out the darkness in our hearts. Teach us your ways. Be with those who are suffering and who are ill. Bring them to health, spiritually and physically. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's great to gather again and study the lesson. This lesson this week is Sabbath, Experiencing and Living the Character of God. And just to repeat the memory verse, Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. It's the winter season, and this past Sabbath, we had the pleasure of spending the Sabbath day with our pastor in church, and then after church with our pastor and some friends from church as we enjoyed nature. We saw a beautiful sunset on the top of a Korean mountain, and uh, we went for a hike, and it was truly a blessing. We felt the awesome experience of the character of God through the sermon that we heard in church, and then we enjoyed the fellowship of a lunch together, and then we enjoyed the first book of God's character revealed in nature. So Sabbath is meant to be a blessing. It's a not a holiday, but a holy day to be lived out in a way of, of peace and understanding and of rejuvenation, of recommitment to God, and fun fellowship with fellow believers. So we had a really good Sabbath day, and that's how every Sabbath is to be enjoyed. It's not something to uh, hope. It's not something to uh, long for it to be over, as some children do. Is the Sabbath over yet, Dad? I want to watch TV. The things of the world need to fade away into the distance. We shouldn't have so much of a hunger for the things of this world when such a great blessing has been bestowed upon us, and we can enjoy that sweet fellowship. In our Sabbath school lesson, we had a story about a woman named Jody and the, the fellowship that she had with her friend Gail. Mm. And she made it clear, she made it clear that she wasn't going to attend social events on Sabbath. She made that visible, and her faith was made known to those around her. And when I read that, it brought to mind something that happened, oh, I was it about a month or two ago. At work, we had an event. It was a dinner on Friday evening, and it was at a very nice restaurant, and all of the staff were invited. There was a planned celebration for the best teacher of the year, and all sorts of things sounded so nice, but it was on Friday evening. And the, a sheet went around the office, and the administration wanted to know who would be attending the event. So I wrote down, no, I, I wish I could, but I can't. And then the, the director, he was very kind. He came to me and he asked me, why can't you come? Is it because your, your wife will not be there or is it something else? And I said, I, I would really like to be there and be with all of you and enjoy this celebration um, with coworkers and a nice meal and, and so on. But it's on Friday evening and I don't want to put a burden on the restaurant staff and the waiters and so on, and be part of a, a secular thing on a day that is holy and set aside. So I was very kind about it and he understood and he was also kind in understanding that. But we need to make a, a clear distinction between all the work days and God's holy Sabbath. It's not a holiday, but it is a holy day to be enjoyed and to be kept in a reverent way. So it's an opportunity for us to grow spiritually. We have that opportunity every day, but the Sabbath is 24 hours that's set aside that we shouldn't let anything of a worldly nature infringe upon. Let's come close together as family and friends and grow in spiritual ways and really spend that time in holy reverence and worship of God, both in church and in other ways. How do you like to spend the Sabbath day, Wesley? I remember being young and wishing the Sabbath was over. It took many years for me to reach a point where I saw 
the Sabbath as something really meaningful and to have a relationship with God and to desire that and to be able to spend the Sabbath hours with God is, is a wonderful thing. So I really, I really like the Sabbath these days. Around me, though, I don't have a lot of uh, Adventists around me. So I feel kind of alone on Sabbath. And I don't want to be in places where a lot of secular things are happening. So I like to go on long walks and uh, stay out of the house and during the COVID or go to church spend a lot of time at church. Uh, usually I stay at church all day. If I had something else to do, I would do it. Something else that's uh, a, a mission for Christ, then I would do it. But uh, yeah, I, I focus on uh, God during that time. I want to study the Bible. I want to pray. And I wish that my relationship with God that I can have on Sabbath I wish that I had during the week some too. Um, sometimes I get so caught up with work and such that I don't have the spiritual connection that I'd like during the week. So Sabbath is a great blessing for me. I like this heading that we have, our title this week, Sabbath Experiencing and Living the Character of God. The acknowledgement of the Sabbath and the living spirit within us can... Um, show us how to keep the Sabbath and, and be a symbol of that relationship. I was thinking this week uh, about the Sabbath and it's really interesting. I, I have some questions about it. You know, what, why is it holy? Like what is holy about the Sabbath? What does it actually symbolize? God created in six days and rested the Sabbath. Do you have any ideas? What does it reveal about God's character that on well, that ties well into Sunday, that the Sabbath day was not created at Sinai. It was not just one of the Ten Commandments that it was written down at that time that did not exist before. It was written down on the tablets of stone as one of the Ten Commandments, but it existed far before that. Mm -hmm. We read about it in the Genesis account. So we hear how God created everything that we have, the whole world and the sea and the atmosphere and the animals and the plants and humans, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. So we we learn about the powerful and the, the artistic creator, how he had an eye for beauty and the power that he had to create such wonder. When I think of God in a physical sense, have you ever seen one of those old videos of an atomic explosion? That's just a handful of matter that creates such a powerful explosion. Now imagine the inverse of that, that much power creating substance of not only physical matter, but living matter. So I kind of think of God in that way, of just the infinite amount of power put into creative and artistic creation. So he created this perfect world, the perfect Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, all of the animals, everything was put in place. And then why did he do this? He wanted a relationship. He wanted people to be made in his image. He wanted to show his love and his care to humanity and the rest of creation. So in contrast to simply resting, he rested from creating. He had now the opportunity to interact with his creation, with Adam and Eve. So the first Sabbath day for Adam and Eve must have been such a marvel. They were created in their fullness as adults. They didn't experience childhood. They were the only ones who ever had that. But their minds had never experienced anything, right? So they, they have the wonder of creation and all of these animals. God asked Adam to name all of the animals having a spouse, you're newly created and now you have a spouse as well and you're meeting the living God. It must have been an incredibly wonderful experience on that first Sabbath day to see all of what God is through his creation, seeing him face to face in perfection, even looking at yourself in the reflections and in the water and 
marveling at what God did in you. And to some degree, we should have that same wonder in our souls when we see creation today. It's tainted by sin, but the fingerprints of our almighty God still shine through. And each Sabbath day is an opportunity to appreciate the nature, the creation that God created. And whatever good thing is in us, we should give honor and glory to him and also develop those talents. You know, just like the parable of the talents, which was referring to investing in the kingdom. In that parable, it had to do with money. But just as that monetary uh, system were called talents, the talents that we have also should be invested. We shouldn't bury them. If we know how to play the piano, let's do it in church. If we know how to design a website, let's create websites that glorify God and tell of the gospel and reveal God's handiwork in creation and put uh, evolution in its rightful place in the dustbin. Oh, whatever talents that we have, we should use them to glorify God. Sabbath is definitely an opportunity to, to see God in his fullness and to show that to others as well. What significance in the plan of salvation, in the battle between God and Satan, in the great controversy, what is it about Saturday? What is it about the seventh day of the week that God was like, we're going to make this day? The second part of that question is like God blesses us with this seventh day. It's, it's a blessing to us. It's, it's a gift to us. And then so many people look at that gift. They have the wrong conception of who God is. What is the significance of the Sabbath in the great controversy? Do you have any ideas, Brendan? Well, I don't see a direct correlation. Um, we, we do. Oh, maybe know there is. That, may, that's true. That's true. Maybe there is. Maybe it's so subtle we won't see it until we get to heaven. Or maybe it's. Or there not, might just not be any. Yeah, maybe. It doesn't just mean not exactly. it doesn't mean everything of a spiritual nature doesn't tie into everything else directly. Just as a puzzle piece on the le far left, maybe the sky, it's uh, totally blue. It's a gradient of blue, and the down near the bottom right there's a dandelion it it's all part of the same puzzle it's all part of a big picture but it doesn't mean that the sky is a dandelion true so we do know that we have a rest in jesus christ because of the white ro robe of righteousness because of being cleansed from our sins because of the justification by faith we have a peace that passes understanding mm. in the life and death and resurrection of jesus christ so in some sense, that is like a Sabbath day, that we recognize him as the creator, God Almighty, the one that we put our trust in, the one who is the reason for our life and our existence, the one that we are to emulate, and the one that we rest in. So in some way, he is like the Sabbath day, where it, uh, it epitomizes the nature of God and the position of man and the relationship between the two. So we do have that blessing as well. Now, now I, I, even though I do see parallels there, I wouldn't say that, that that's a direct correlation. It's just a strong parallel. The bottom of Sunday's lesson says that um, what are some educational opportunities that Adam and Eve had on the first Sabbath? And the really key one is which of these opportunities do we still have today? Well, as we were, we were just talking about, they had the opportunity to meet God face to face. They saw the beauty of his creation in the, the plant life, in the animal life. They had the wonder of seeing their own bodies and the, and the magnificence of God's handiwork. And they had the experience of, of marriage, of having a spouse. The, the dating opportunities were slim, but it was a perfect match. <laughs> and... Uh, so God had the perfect woman for Adam and, and the perfect man for Eve. All of that was a tremendous blessing. and It must have been overwhelming in, in, in all the good ways for them on that beautiful Sabbath day that they spent together. Maybe we should listen to Genesis 1 and 2 now. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. 
Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse, and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day. Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into the place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit, trees on the earth bearing fruit from their kind with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarmed after their kind, and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, and there was morning a fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beast of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that, that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Genesis 2 Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host. By the seventh day God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the account of the heavens and the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God had made her earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. 
Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havahalah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. The Dilium and the Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gishon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed it up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. On to Monday's lesson. Yes, Uh, a time of rediscovery. So this brings up uh, an amazing thing that God did for the people of Israel, and that was giving them the bread of life, manna. Manna in Hebrew means, what is it? So God gave from his own hand, from heaven, every day, food, bread of life for the people of Israel. And at first they were very grateful for it. But over time, it became something that they they needed it. They still needed it, but they came to despise it. And I see a strong parallel with the people of Israel, manna, the bread of life, and the Christian walk. So they ate this manna for 40 years, according to Exodus 16.35. And it was so important for them to remember it that God instructed Moses to keep an omer of manna to remind them of how he fed them in the wilderness. That's from uh, Exodus 16, 32 and and 33. Mm -hmm. We know that God gives us daily our daily bread. And we know that Christ's body was symbolized by the bread broken at Passover in the upper room with the disciples. So every day we receive the bread of his body, and this is a reminder of what he did for us. It's also a a reminder of the word of God. The word of God is is life to us as well. It feeds our souls. So I think it's really important that we we don't feel that the sweet word of God has become stale Mm -hmm. like the people of Israel did concerning manna. It wasn't stale. It was just as nutritious and delicious as it it was 40 years earlier. But because of their falling, their times of falling away from God, they they didn't realize how a consistent gift is just as good 40 years later as it is on the first day. Mm. So we really need to have that understanding, that real deep desire and appreciation for the word of God to eat the bread daily and to realize that the body of Christ, that we have at communion as a reminder, that we have spiritually every day, is such an essential point in our Christian walk. 
let's not let either of those things seem stale to our souls, but let's have an appetite for them. Let's have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yes, um, I think I've probably heard a couple of sermons over the years on our uh, devotional lives connected to this story. We do need the manna from the word every every day. And it's something I want to personally I need to work on uh, to become closer to God every day, to wake up with Christ on my mind and uh, to have that devotional time uh, and, and not just like some quick prayer always, but like really a good devotion, really uh, tell God what needs to be said, some meaningful things. Uh, sometimes prayers need to be, you know, they need to take the amount of time that need to be taken. The Sabbath school lesson, uh, Brendan, do you remember being a teenager? Vaguely. Yeah, me, me too. Um, a teenager finds the Sabbath boring. What, what would be your recommendation? Well, it's the teen years are definitely difficult in that teens tend to focus on uh, socializing and entertainment far too much. And I really think it's the place of the parents not to back away during those years, even though the teens tend to be more forceful and rebellious, but to befriend them and give them a, let's say, a firm and loving direction. When a child is young, it's easy to take away a toy that maybe would be dangerous. But when they become a teenager, they're more likely to bite back with their words. If you are still exhibiting your authority as their parent and God has placed in the lives of each parent, their children, they are the ones responsible for their upbringing, not only physically and mentally, but also spiritually. So, I think that the parents need to make Sabbath an integral part of the lives of their children. And just as you would plan a family vacation, Sabbath should be planned in a way that keep it a holy day, but make it enjoyable for the youth. Keep them active. Kids above all else, they want to feel fulfilled. And that's why they're seeking entertainment to live vicariously in some type of fantasy world in a video game or on YouTube through something humorous or adventurous uh, or socially with their friends or online with their friends. They want to be valued and appreciated and they want to feel a level of success. So somehow I think it's important that the parent find ways to make Sabbath both enjoyable and uh, serving the community is one way that is really fulfilling. When you have the opportunity to touch the life of another and you see their life change forever, or even change in the moment and hoping for forever, that's a real important point. And I think it can be attractive to young people. So parents need to stay involved and keep in mind the needs of their children as their children are developing and also keep in mind the precepts that God has set forth in his word concerning how to keep the Sabbath holy. So looking at Tuesday's lesson, it's uh, entitled Time for Learning Priorities. The ups and downs of Israel's experience with God were closely linked to the way that they related to the Sabbath. And isn't that the case with us as well? I think that if we uh, set aside the Sabbath day or we compromise it, then we lose a lot of the blessing that he has in store for us. Mm. So we should always remember our creator, the creation that he made, namely us, but also the animals and everything else of beauty. It's such a testimony to his awesome power and his artistry. Really enjoy worship, not just sit there and hear the music as if it's a concert, but be actively involved either from the pew or up front, after church and singing groups, sharing music in other ways. In our church, we're hoping to start a media ministry in which we can uh, share both uh, music 
and testimony, Bible verses, little mini sermons, all online. So we're setting up a, a tiny part of our church area, our church building, uh, with a backdrop, with lighting, with a professional microphone, so that members of our small church can come there and share what they have. Mm. Because really, when you share, you grow. There's that expression, sharing is caring. And it's true, especially when it comes to things of faith. So let's not have Sabbath become a burden, something that we feel is weighing us down and we want it to be over, like, like we're some type of child, but something of true value. We want Sabbath to be a, a delight, uh, a time to rest, but also a time to worship, a time to share, a time to recognize our Creator for who He is. And further down... In Tuesday's lesson, it says that uh, we should keep from doing as you please, don't go your own way, and avoid doing as you please or speaking idle words. That's taken from Isaiah 58, uh, 13 and 14. Isaiah 58, 1 to 14. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways as a nation that has done righteousness and has not forsaken the ordinances, ordinance of their God. They ask me for my just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. Why have ye fasted and you do not see? Why have ye, we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth? and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house? When you see the naked, do you to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, and the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins and you will rise up the old age foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach and restorer of the streets in which you dwell. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasures and speaking your own words, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, all week we're really encompassed with work and other activities. When you meet your friends or family members at church, it's easy to just start talking about the burdens that you have and uh, what you've been up to and treat it as a social club. But that's not what the Sabbath is intended for. You might bring up some burdens that you have and take that opportunity to kneel down together and pray about them. Just talking about our burdens with each other, throwing negativity back and forth, really doesn't get us anywhere. But if we place them at the foot of the cross, then God can can and will intervene in our lives. Mm -hmm. He's he's there to hear our burdens. 
And, you know, it's good to also share with a brother or sister in Christ, because maybe it's something that emotionally you're having a hard time dealing with. And when you do pray together, you can uphold one another. And that's a, yeah, we need, that's a we real need more of that. Yeah, that's a real treasure and a special thing. And another reason to come together as a church, because at, on your own, you may have your devotions and you may, you may have your worship, but who do you have to hold on to? So let's recognize that the fellowship of believers is very important, and mm. it's, it's something that we should value. I like what you're saying. Um, the church should be a place where people are comfortable together, sharing um, in a meaningful way. When someone is sharing up an issue and we need comfort and we need sympathy and we need to be Christian about it and not just like this is gossip or something, right? So in church, we are sharing issues and problems. We need to have more prayer. We need to be more sympathetic, a, a caring ear. We are a member of God's family and we can sympathize with the person and pray with the person uh, pray together. It should be a very meaningful time. That meaningful time focused on God is very important. Brendan, you're answering all the questions pretty much I would have ever asked you this, this week. The one thing I wanted to say is that there's a special thing about the manna, and that is that it didn't come on Sabbath. Uh, and Yes, that's a good point. And... The Jews should have known, the Hebrews should have known about the Sabbath. Um, I'm sure someone in the multitude knew about it. Um, but a lot of people had forgotten it. They had been slaves for 400 years and it had become less of a priority. And all these people had to become reacquainted with the Sabbath. And um, this is how God really pushed it home. Hey, I told you no work on the Sabbath. There's no food on the Sabbath. What are you going out and seeking manna for? And for that to happen for 40 years, it must have really ingrained in that generation that entered the promised land, the importance of the Sabbath. And they, you know, with the Onyx Stones, with Moses, you know, they knew the significance of the Sabbath and why it was so important. You know, the Sabbath was a huge sign demarcating them from other nations and other religions. I'm still, I still marvel at that when they crossed into the promised lands, they left almost all their stuff and marched a bunch far away into this valley to hear the, the, um, the law as they entered Canaan and all their stuff was not touched. <laughs> Everybody was scared of them. Um, God really protected them on the, the Sabbaths, especially the, um, the festivals, right? The feast days, they would, they were supposed to go to, to Shiloh or to Jerusalem and their God protected them. Uh, even though that would have been the perfect time to invade but they were not. They were protected. Jeremiah 17, 19 to 27. Thus the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the public gate through which the kings of Judah come in and go out, as well as in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say to them, Listen to the word of the Lord, kings of Judah and all Judah and all inhabitants of Jerusalem, who come in through these gates. Thus says the Lord, Take heed for yourselves, and do not carry any load on the Sabbath day, or bring anything in through the gates of Jerusalem. You shall not bring a load out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy, as I commanded your forefathers. Yet they did not listen or incline their ears, but stiffened their necks in order not to listen or take correction. 
but it will come about if you listen attentively to me, declares the Lord, to bring no load in through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but to keep the Sabbath day holy by doing no work on it. Then there will come in through the gates of this city kings and princes, sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city will be inhabited forever. They will come in from the cities of Judah and from the environs of Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the lowlands, from the hill country, and from the Negev. Bring burnt offerings, sacrifices, grain offerings, and incense, and bring sacrifices of thanksgiving to the house of the Lord. But if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy, but by not carrying a load and coming in through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in this its gates, and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem and not be quenched. Do we delight in the Sabbath? What can we do to change if we do not? I would say that it's varied throughout my life, but now with my heavy workload and the joy of the spiritual message and the sweet fellowship at my church here in Korea, I definitely delight in the Sabbath day. And I look forward to it every single week. Yeah, I, I think I do too. Um, I really uh, appreciate the rest and the spiritual opportunity that it provides. I think I can feel closer to God on the Sabbath. And it frustrates me during the other six days of the week that I don't feel that same connection. I'd like to be even closer. On Wednesday's lesson, we have a time for finding balance. And we know that Jesus and the Pharisees had a lot of issues with the Sabbath. And the Pharisees had their traditions and their maxims uh, and their orders to uh, follow the Sabbath in a very specific way. And Jesus was like, uh, that is not right at all. Uh, we have a lot of things we can do on the Sabbath for the glory of God. And this is also where, you know, the Sabbath was made for God. I, the Sabbath was made for man. What am I saying? The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Again, there's just something special about this day. And the only way we can keep this day holy is for the Holy Spirit to be holy in us. There's something though about Jesus's arguments with the Pharisees that are that are cute because, you know, they're like you can't even um, as as Matthew 12 and, and Matthew 13 speak of. You, you couldn't even rub the grains in your hands uh, because that was a kind of threshing and that was a kind of work, according to the Pharisees. And Jesus is like, well, don't the priest work on the Sabbath? <laughs> it just like really destroys their arguments. I listened to part of Desire of Ages on the chapter on the Sabbath, and she said something really interesting. She said, false religion always puts humanity on a lower level. And, and she, she made that broad distinction that heathen religions always put humanity on a lower level. And I know the story, like if you look on the internet, there's a a religion in India somewhere, I don't know, where they actually worship rats and they are blessed to be bitten by a rat and they drink milk with rats and they all want to die and become rats. And it's just like, what? <laughs> are they serious? Um, and also you can see the same thing in the Pharisees who would go rescue a sheep on the Sabbath, but they didn't want to rescue someone from illness and from the, the shackles of sin on the Sabbath. So it, it's, it's really interesting, the, those ideas, um, and how Jesus really just destroyed their arguments uh, in such a powerful way. Also, there's something interesting, Brendan. Um, when the New Testament was written, we know it was written a little bit after, uh, a little bit later, and it was not written like as it was happening. 
And it's very interesting that the idea that these people, 30 years after Jesus was raised from the dead, that almost one eighth of like one in eight chapters deals somehow with the Sabbath in the Gospels. And it's like if it's 30 years after the cross and supposedly the Sabbath has been done away with, why is the Sabbath such an important issue to be writing about Jesus? And also, you know, we learn from scriptures that everything Jesus did could not be written in a book. It was just too many things. So out of all the things that could have been written about, so much of it is about the Sabbath, supposedly from a time when the Sabbath is supposedly not important anymore. And it just clearly shows that the Sabbath is very important after the cross as well as it was before. Um, Yeah, that's true. I don't think that they ever had that thought cross their minds that the Sabbath was done away with or any of the other commandments. Yeah. There's no evidence that any of them modern. It's a modern twisted uh, proof text theology. Right. That that does away with the Sabbath day or substitutes it with Sunday, the day or any day of the week or every day of the week or whatever. Well, nobody, no, no mainstream denomination uses any other day except Sunday and no other excuse except that it was the day of resurrection. But none of that is touched on in the Gospels or anywhere else throughout the New Testament because it wasn't an issue at the time. It was, it's a modern day misinterpretation of a few exclusive texts that are, that if you look at the sum total of the Sabbath in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there is no denying that it is the day, uh, a memorial of creation. It is in the t- Ten Commandments written on stone by God's own hand, and mm-hmm. that even in heaven, in the earth made new, will keep the Sabbath day holy. Mm-hmm. You made some good points regarding Christ and the Pharisees and Sadducees regarding the Sabbath day and the interpretation of the law and how to keep it holy. As we've touched on in previous lessons, the the Pharisees had two Torahs. They had the written Torah, and then they had the oral Torah, which they said was given to them only and was passed on from generation to generation through an oral tradition, and that they had an exclusive interpretation of the law that the others did not. So they used right. this as a hinge point, as leverage against the people of Israel and put a lot of burdens on their backs. They had two main ways of doing this, the ma'asim and the takanot, the things that they said the people had to do and the things that they did by example. And all of these were extra biblical. They were beyond the written Torah. And so Jesus condemns them for these types of burdens placed on the backs of the people that no one could ever follow, and that were adding to the law of God. So they would add to the law of God, they would take away from the law of God, and all of these things are strictly forbidden by God to do. Mm. So we can understand why there was such a confrontation between Christ and the Pharisees. And in a similar manner, people these days, religious leaders, often do the same thing. They're not Pharisees. They do not claim to have the oral Torah, but they want you to do what they say, and they want you to follow what they do. They do the same type of thing, the takanot and the ma'asim. But we need to hold strictly to the word of God, to read it, to understand it, to be led by the spirit in revelation of it, and to live it truly in our lives. So let Christ reign in our lives. That's what we really need to do. Not to listen to anyone who gives a misinterpretation of the word of God. The the people who, the the pastors or the ministers or the the religions where um, they are misinterpreting the scriptures or rejecting part of the scriptures or stuff like that. They are no longer relying on the scriptures as 
the authority. They're now putting themselves in their own interpretation as the authority. And so That's they right. take they take away from the authority of the Bible. Absolutely. The they're Bible really, needs to explain fact, itself. Yeah, they're really, in fact, placing themselves above God. Just as you say that the the pagan religions always place humanity below an object, like your illustration of humanity below a rat. They are placing themselves above God himself. And some simple misinterpretation uh, or proof texting, taking a couple of verses, not looking at the language, the history, or the context, or the sum total of all verses related to that subject, and then creating an entirely wrong doctrine based on that. So they're really putting themselves above God. That's the most dangerous place anybody of a, in a spiritual leadership position could ever place themselves. There's one other section of Wednesday's lesson I'd like to read. It was made, created, as a unique opportunity for people to learn the character of God, to learn experientially by valuing his creation. I thought that that's such a great way of describing the Sabbath day, to learn about the character of God and his creation. Do you have anything else to add for Wednesday's lesson? Uh, no, not really. But I like the question at the bottom. Uh, what about your own Sabbath keeping? Have you turned it into a day of just do's and don'ts rather than a time to really truly rest in the Lord and know him better? If so, how can you change so that you can get from it what God intends for you? And I, I, I don't know your answer with this, but my answer would be something along the lines of uh, a closer relationship with, with God and the Holy Spirit will change our perceptions and our ideas. We understand who God is and have a better relationship with him. We're going to have a better dealing with the Sabbath. The very basics of do's and don'ts is foundational to the commandments. And then as long as we understand the, those precepts, then where, where we take it from there can be filled with create, creativity. And, and really, we can have an opportunity to marvel in God and his relationship with us. For instance, we are not to work on the Sabbath day. We're not to even have the stranger within our gates work on the Sabbath day. That's a don't. And it's not one that can be compromised and still keep the Sabbath holy. But that doesn't mean that we run around our house and stop the postman from coming near our post box and, and spend the whole day worried about anyone doing anything. That's just to be caught up in the foundational understanding of the premise for the day in that it's to be a day of rest. It's to be a day that we truly set aside work and we focus on God. And now that we have our focus reassigned from the necessities of life, which are six days a week we're working, the seventh day is a day of rest, then what do we do? It's all you said of do's and don'ts. What do we do on the Sabbath day? That's something that can be expanded upon in creative and wonderful ways. So should it be a day that, like the Jews, they went to the, the temple, should we go to church? Yes, it's a benefit to go to church and to fellowship with others, uh, to hear the word of God spoken, to pray, to praise God. And then what about after that? Is it a day that we do the things that our hearts desire, anything that crosses our mind, uh, should we revert to entertainment? No, we're, we're instructed not to do that. So now we know we're not, we're not to do that. What can we do? Anything else that keeps it a holy day. Let's spend the day with God. I enjoy singing. I'm not the best singer, but I enjoy singing, and so does my wife. And we'd like, we like to sing together. So is there a blessing in that? Is that a... Is that something that causes us to feel at rest and at peace and grow closer to the Lord? Yeah, it does. So just as Adam and Eve had such expansive opportunity to know and to grow with God in the Garden of Eden in perfection, we too have that opportunity every Sabbath day. So there are foundational principles 
that are in place, and then where we take it from there, walking hand in hand with the Lord, is a, a beautiful journey. Let's move ahead to Thursday's lesson, a time for community. Jesus modeled for his disciples the practice of weekly attendance at the synagogue. So throughout the New Testament, we have quite a number of examples of Jesus going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, uh, as well as others. I forgot the exact number, but if memory serves, I think it's 84 throughout the whole New Testament. The synagogue or the church is definitely a place in which the new Christian converts came every Sabbath day. They kept the Sabbath days holy. Mm -hmm. um, it, wasn't, it wasn't only the Jews, but also the Gentiles who were converted, uh, the, the new believers who kept the Sabbath day. They gave, it, uh, they gave encouraging testimony. Mm -hmm. They gave scriptural exposition, uh, preaching, teaching, sharing, and youth meetings. These are all opportunities that we have in our church to enjoy the Sabbath day. And in the U.S., traditionally, we've had AY, Adventist Youth, and other places in the world, too. Um, and that's, like you were mentioning early on, what do we do for the youth that have, uh, they don't have the zeal for the Sabbath day? Pathfinders or Adventist Youth is another opportunity for the youth to get involved after potluck. So they have, church, they have Sabbath school, they have church, they have potluck. And then afterwards, in the afternoon, they can have meetings with the Pathfinders, uh, the other youth members, and also Adventist youth to grow in faith and to help the community. Even though it's a day of rest, and, and we should rest if we are physically tired, if we're not physically tired, let's take every opportunity to grow in faith and to reach other people uh, with the gospel and in helping in different ways. There are some days where I'm really tired and I just end up sleeping some sometimes. But I, I do my best to avoid sleeping on Sabbath. I feel like it's it's not a day for that necessarily. I, I don't think it should I don't I don't feel comfortable having Sabbath be a day of just sleeping. I like how you're spending the Sabbath in nature and stuff and Bible studies and stuff. I like that. I think that's more appropriate and, and spreading the gospel, you know, however we can, you know, outreach is always a good idea on the Sabbath. I, I feel sometimes I'm praying on the Sabbath and end up falling asleep at the end of, in the middle of my prayers. Um, but I, I maybe, maybe you need more physical rest than you are willing to admit. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe. And, and, and that's really the, our place as, as Christian believers, we need to recognize how our week has worn us down. So if we're, if we're not physically exhausted, but we're spiritually hungry, then we really need to eat, eat spiritual food. I do think that we should attend church and participate and enjoy that fellowship and that worship service, but we need to recognize our own limitations. So if we're in a type of position that really wears us down physically, realize that the Sabbath is a day of rest. So there's no harm in resting that afternoon. And if you need to take a nap, take that nap. Re be rejuvenated for the coming week because you have work ahead. But if you're not, then take every opportunity to grow in faith. Yes. Yeah. So yes. It's, it comes with a, a, a sense of responsibility and personal maturity to realize your needs and to use those 24 hours in a way that is a blessing to you and to others and brings you closer to God. Right. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Friday's lesson, we have a couple of quotes um, from Desire of Ages. No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should designate them as worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. 
through faith, they must be partakers of the righteousness of Christ. When the command was given to Israel, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Lord said also to them, you shall be holy men unto me. Exodus 28 and 22, 31. Only thus could the Sabbath distinguish Israel as the worshipers of God. And then the last quote, then the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy. As a sign of his sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all through Christ, become a part of Israel of God. I like this. Like I, I get, a, I'm getting a feeling here of through this lesson and what we're talking about is that if we relish our relationship with God and we want a better relationship with Him, we are going to use the Sabbath to do that, and we're going to see the Sabbath as a blessing for that. And if we have misconceptions or misunderstandings of God's character. Uh, distractions, whatever, maybe full of proof text. Um, we're not going to have Sabbath mean what it should mean. And this is like this is saying here, then the Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy. We are becoming holy as the Holy Spirit changes us and our desires and our wants become more in line with Christ. That's well said. So we should never make a, a slicing separation between our choices and actions and the work and power of the Holy Spirit within us, because both work in conjunction. We are not to sit on the sofa of our lives and the Holy Spirit changes us without anything of our own. And we are not to do everything of our own and the Holy Spirit takes a back seat or is ignored altogether. It is always in conjunction with the conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit and the choices and actions of our lives. At every crossroads that we're at, we are empowered to do what is right, but we can choose to do what is wrong. And that is a very clear demarcation, the line in the sand of a growing or a dying Christian. One important point is that these are the promises that were given to Israel the God of Israel. So what part do they play in our lives as Gentiles? How can we claim the promises of God? How can we adhere to the laws in the Old Testament when they were given to Israel? Is because we were grafted in to those same promises and to those same requirements. Christ was the fulfillment of the law. He was the justification. He's the justification of our faith. So what does that entail? When Christ died on the cross, the curtain between the holy and the most holy place was torn in two. That was the end of the temple services, of the priestly order, of the sacrifices. Of those things that pointed to Christ's ministry, those came to an end because Christ came in the end. That was the end of the sacrificial system. But that doesn't mean it's the end of the law as a whole. There are many different laws in the Old Testament. The Ten Commandments are distinctly set apart. There are many other ones that expand upon the Ten Commandments. Uh, for instance, just in brief, the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Very brief. Very, very brief. What does that mean? If you look at the, the Old Testament and you start reading about the laws of sexual relations between people, it gives very clear instructions who you are not to have sexual relations with. Many, 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 many instructions. Just to be clear, so the people of Israel understood what that meant, do not commit adultery. There is an expansion upon that. So that type, those types of laws are very much in effect. Even though the priestly order is over, the sacrifice has been given, the perfect lamb was slain, those same requirements of the law are in place. Uh, I would agree okay. to that. And I would say, I would say that you can go one step further and say like Moses is expounding on the law or God's instructions to Moses explaining the law does not replace the law. And also Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount expounding on the law, explaining it, 
doesn't replace it either. Very well right? said. Mm. That's very well said. And that's the yoke. The, the, the teachers, not only Christ, but other, other teachers in that day, they had a yoke. And it was sometimes illustrated physically as the cloak that they would carry. So Elijah and Elisha had a cloak, a part of their garment that they would carry uh, wrapped around themselves. And that was a symbol of the way that they taught the scriptures. Even the Pharisees had a yoke. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light, easy and light. So he had a way that he taught the scriptures, and it was true to the word. He didn't deviate and add to it and take away from it like the Pharisees did. He taught it plainly and truthfully, just as God had always intended. And you're, you're right on the mark that the Sermon on the Mount and all the other teachings of Christ simply expanded upon that those basic principles, the intention of the law. And he actually gave one, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you even look on a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery in your heart. So you see a foundational principle within the law of God that he is explaining in more detail, but he's not adding to the law and he's not taking away from the law. So whenever we think of ourselves in the Christian walk that we're in, we must realize that we are grafted into the promises and the requirements of Israel. He wanted them to be a distinct nation and a distinct people to take his word to the world, to be a nation set aside, a people set aside, a remnant, the ones that were true to him, to draw all men unto him. And we as Gentiles grafted into Israel are to do the same thing. So it's a great burden upon us, but it's not something that we do alone. Just as we've always said, the Holy Spirit is upon us, and we are to work in conjunction with him to finish this great commission. Let us see his kingdom come. I yearn for the Sabbath and the relationship with God. I want that relationship more continually, more fully. Okay, let's bow our heads for closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. Every Sabbath that comes around and I see the beautiful sunrise, I think of your marvelous creation, all of the tremendous artistry that you have put into each and every animal, from the, the tiniest insect to the long-necked giraffe to the mighty elephant upon the plains of the Serengeti. I think of all of the beauty that you've drawn into the delicate flower petals and your handiwork upon each one of us. We thank you for the day of rest in all of its bounty, in the physical rest that it brings, in the spiritual rejuvenation that we experience, in our fellowship with other church members, with friends and family. We thank you for the opportunity to fall on bended knee, to worship you more fully, to raise our hands in praise, to enjoy the fullness of the Sabbath as you intended. We ask for your presence upon us each day, and especially on the Sabbath day, draw us close to your soul. We want to be one with you in the likeness of Jesus Christ. We want to walk with you each day. Thank you for the many blessings that you have given us, the ways that you have protected us, and always the love and care that you've shown. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sad. 
as his weekly custom was. Feel the fury of the rabbis, for he would not heed their laws. So they killed him on a hillside as the sun began to fade, but he even kept the Sabbath as they laid him in the grave. Holy day! Forsaken and forgotten, desecrated and profaned, but the sacred fourth commandment is still valid and unchanged. Hear the Father gently calling, if you love me, heed each one, not for merit salvation but because you love my son holy day purified set apart sanctified enter into joy Thank you for listening. Please click the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Bible readings taken from the NASB are copyrighted by the Lachman Foundation.